Hello, everybody, and welcome to the November 2023 um, episode of law.mit.edu's idea flow, um, a relatively informal um, set of discussion and demo sessions where we highlight what we think are some of the most um, interesting or important, relevant, and timely happenings in the area of computational law generally. And nowadays, specifically, that means applications of generative AI to help solve legal use cases or to achieve um, uh, you know, goals that, that we may have for law and legal processes. We've got two really interesting examples of just just those types of projects and initiatives. And to get us started today, um, I have invited some friends and colleagues at Consumer Reports Innovation Lab to show us some really interesting and useful things that they're starting to do with privacy policies as part of a innovative um, application that puts more data control back in the hands of consumers. And so with that, I'd love to introduce um, Ginny and also Dan, uh, and if you could introduce yourselves and your roles, um, and then dive right into this extremely cool application of generative AI that you've um, that you've been devising and starting to deploy to get on top of privacy policies on behalf of consumers. Take it away. Thanks, Daza, and thanks for inviting us to be here. It's um, really awesome to be with all of you. I've attended this many times and seen a lot of great presentations here. So it's an honor to get to present to this group. Um, my name is Jenny Foss and I lead the product and R&D group um, within Consumer Reports Innovation Lab. Uh, so my team is responsible for a lot of research and fast prototyping about how we use technologies to power consumer protection use cases. Um, and I'm here, I'm here with my colleague, Dan Leininger. Uh, hi, yes, I am Dan Leininger. I am the head of experimental engineering in the Innovation Lab at Consumer Reports, and um, very nice to meet you all. So today, the two of us are going to um, let you all peek into the hood of what we have brewing here in our Innovation Lab. Um, all of this work is very early stage experimental work. None of it has been deployed to production. However, the way that our lab works is we are building products that are serving consumers every day, and we use those products to help us figure out which problems we want to prioritize solving with new technologies. Um, and so specifically, our group has done a lot of work um, for a few years now um, in the area of privacy and consumer data rights. Um, Daza has been one of our kind of closest partners and co-conspirators in this work, um, but uh, consumer data rights are, are a new kind of fundamental right that we have as consumers in this country. Uh, these are rights that are enshrined under new laws to privacy in states like California and about a dozen others. Um, these are laws that give you a right to your data in various forms, um, the right to uh, tell a company to stop selling your data, um, to tell a company that they should send you a copy of your data, um, as well as to tell a company to delete your data entirely. And these are rights that we've been really excited about at Consumer Reports because we think they give consumers a whole new kind of agency in a digital marketplace. Um, so we've been doing a lot of research as well as um, experimentation and even product development around this idea of consumer data rights. Um, I'm going to start by just showing you a product that is our kind of flagship data rights product that we just released, and that will give the context for some of the experimentation we've been doing with large language models and privacy policies. Um, so I'm going to share my screen um, and give you all a glimpse of our new product, um, which is called Permission Slip, um, confirming that this screen is visible to the group. Yep, looks great. Awesome. Yep. Um, so Permission Slip is a, an, a mobile app that helps you take back control of the data companies have about you. Um, it's available on iOS and Android. And what we did with Permission Slip is we wanted to make it really easy and seamless for consumers to use their new rights to their data, their rights to privacy across the country. Um, and so what this is, is it's a um, it's an interface that allows you to find out what kinds of data a company collects. Um, we have a whole library of companies in the app, and we read the company's privacy policies to and, and interpret that for you so you understand what data a company like Home Depot has about you. 
Um, and then we give you as a consumer easy ways to manage that data by activating your data rights. Um, and so we offer two rights right now in permission slip. One is we let you send a request and tell a company to stop selling your data. Um, and then the second is that we allow you to send a request that tells a company to delete your data entirely. Um, and so what's important to, to understand from these screens is that a lot of what our team is doing under the hood every day is reading privacy policies from companies and interpreting them so that consumers can make an informed choice about how to manage data. So let's just segue into exactly what that process used to look like in a manual sense. Um, so I'm hoping you all are seeing a slide right now um, about our team's process um, to help to, to educate consumers about the kinds of data companies collect. So um, what that process has been is that we collect copies of a company's official privacy policy. Um, we have a consistent way of coding these privacy policies. Um, we look for the kind of data that companies collect and we try to articulate that data in one of 17 different buckets, uh, which are the 17 types of data that different laws stipulate exist. Um, and then we put that into this kind of nice and hopefully easy to interpret interface in the permission slip app. So for a company like McDonald's, you can see what identifiers they collect about you, what account information they collect about you, et cetera, et cetera. And this is something that our team um, has been doing manually for many months. Uh, we've hired people who are pursuing their PhDs in usable privacy to help us interpret these privacy policies on behalf of consumers. Um, and But what we've found, especially as um, you know, ChatGPT was announced, there's all of this interest in large language models and how they might be applied. We realized that we had like a, a really clear cut use case for ways that a large language model could help us take in large numbers of privacy policies, interpret them consistently, and then show information to consumers in a way that helps them make an informed choice. Um, so I'll, I'll show you all just um, kind of what this has looked like. And then Dan will do like a, a live demo after we show you some of the kind of pre-recorded um, behavior of this research app that primarily Dan has developed in partnership with, with my team that runs the permission slip app. Um, and so we had 24 steps or 24 things we would look at when we looked at a company's privacy policy as we tried to interpret that privacy policy for consumers. Um, and what's been cool is that um, we've been able to um, use large language models to automate all 24 steps of um, of kind of interpreting a privacy policy and then spitting out um, a distilled version of it that a consumer can use. Um, so I'll just show a, a pre-recorded demo um, and then hand it over to Dan to show you a little bit more in depth how the research app works. Um, so let's say we want to add a new company. So this is a company that we don't have in permission slip right now, but it's a company that we think consumers will want to manage their data with. So in this example, we have Tinder, the dating app, which has a lot of sensitive data about people. Um, what you're seeing here is that we're able to um, get a, a description of Tinder. Uh, we're able to quickly fetch a logo. Um, and then we're able to put in a URL for Tinder's privacy policy. Um, we add that document to our database. And then uh, here we go to the section of the privacy policy that is about the information that Tinder is collecting. Um, and we snatch that section um, as and kind of use it as the, the context. And then uh, Dan presses this create company button in the demo. Um, it takes a few minutes. Um, so we'll actually move on to the next video to show you all what happens when um, this data is generated. Um, so what you see here is um, what we've been able to glean from the privacy policy um, using large language models. So um, we have been able to um, answer lots of different questions about the privacy policy. We even provide the source text for what parts of the privacy policy um, answer the questions. Um, and uh, um, all of this information is information that um, is then kind of fed into the reasoning behind um, how we advise the consumer on how to manage their data. Um, and so what you see here is an experimental branch of the permission slip app. And this is an experimental Tinder card that we just generated in this demo. Um, so you're able to see the 17 categories of data. 
um, you're able to see some advice on what you might consider if you're going to tell Tinder to stop selling your data or tell Tinder to delete it. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen there and hand it over to Dan to give you all um, more kind of uh, in-depth uh, summary of kind of the process we went through and how this all works. Um, but I guess before handing over to Dan, just any questions on like the problem we were trying to solve or the general approach before we dive into some of the specifics? Well, firstly, let the record reflect that in chat, one of uh, the um, completely random unbidden comments was simply one word, wow. <laughs> uh, and uh, I concur. Um, but but having said that, it does raise so many questions and we've got a great group here. So um, does if anyone has questions, um, feel free to pipe up at this point. Also, we can hold them until after after Dan's part. Um, but but yeah, we'll, I, we'll, I, Jenny gave a really great overview. And um, please, if anyone has any questions and wants to do a discussion of this um, as well, I'm going to go a little bit more deeply into you know some of the specific questions we were trying to answer and maybe some of the problems we ran into, and um, some of the work that we're thinking about going into the future. Um, but yeah, please feel free to ask questions along the way. One thing that I'll just get us started in the back of my mind, I, I'm almost always asking the same question when I see this type of um, application, which is what actually was the prompt? And were you were you using um, if it was opening eye, were you using a system prompt in conjunction with specific prompts? Uh, and and then also, how did you the other half of that that question about prompts is the input for the output. How did you control the output? to basically regularize its you know shape and format so that it would fit into this very structured you know um um output that 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 you need so that it doesn't start you know kind of like homespun you know things like hey thanks that's a great question here's my answers or other like extraneous uh, verbiage that we don't want yeah exactly and here i'm going to try to give me a second i'll bring up some of the prompts uh, that you so you guys can check them out and yes you're right and all of this stuff and in my experience working with LLMs generally and working with frameworks with LLMs, the, like always just sort of dive down until you can figure out what the prompt is and what people are talking about is, is the best way to sort of uh, step back and see what the system is trying to do. Um, so I love that question, Daza. And just give me, um, give me one second here and I'll see if I can bring up uh, a good example of one. Uh, but uh... And while you're doing that, just uh, for those uh, who are here who may not be, you know, completely steeped in the technology or what we're even talking about. Uh, one of the things with this generative AI, you know, that those are, those are applications that you would have heard of would be chat GPT is the big one, but there's, there's quite a few is that it's natural language. And so what that means is like the, the prompt isn't like a SQL query or a Boolean or some, something like that. Uh, it, it's, you, you, you kind of, it's it's conversational almost in in the, the way that it works and that that provides all kinds of interesting opportunities um, to apply it for legal use cases where you know law it could hardly be more of a like a word and language based um, field. So with that little patter, um, back to you, Dan. Great, and thank you. Um, it turns out that I cannot bring that up, but I'm going to bring up just some code. So I have a. Um, a newer version of this app that has, goes into some detail a little bit about what these prompts look like, but instead I'm going to share you just on some code and we'll go through them here. One second. Uh, let's see, okay. So, you all see that now? It looks good. Great. Um, so what this is, a lot of this uh, logic is, um, the goal of this was to try to get these things to uh, to export JSON. So our goal, like going into this, there's a lot of ways, and even in the releases that OpenAI released yesterday, that's like you can just sort of specify JSON coming out of this stuff. But when I first started digging into this, and this is still where it exists in our app, there's a bunch of ways you can do this with a JSON schema and other ways, but we were sort of 
what I saw one example of someone using TypeScript schemas in order to, to identify the things that you wanted to get out of it, and then using comments in the code to identify more specifically what you want to get out of those definitions. And so this app is basically based off of that. And like I said, you can do this with JSON schema and other ways to sort of define what the structure of the output is. Um, but this is an example of a um, of a query that is, we're trying to get out all of the data rights methods um, from a uh, from a privacy policy. And those data rights methods are like the the your how can a consumer or an authorized agent exercise their right to um, you know opt out of sale, ex exercise their right to delete, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is the prompt that goes in and does it. And you can see that it's a bunch of uh, it's a regular sort of system prompt instruction. Uh, it sets up this schema, and the schema says go through and find uh, anywhere if we use like a RAG approach, which basically we load these uh, privacy policies into a vector database. We use a context query to find these relevant sections of the document, and then we use these prompts to, to answer these questions based on those documents. And so this one, it's complicated. So what we're trying to figure out is like an array of submission methods. And so what we're turning is like basically a list and those lists are like, what is the method? What is the type of method? How can it be used? So for example, the action type would be phone and here's the phone number. Um, and uh, here is, uh, you know, let's see. Um, here is the privacy infrastructure provider, if it's something like OneTrust or things like that. And all this information helps actually on our back end when we're setting up companies to do these requests, this is a really good first pass. And I feel like it's, you know, none of this stuff is ever 100% correct. It's always comes out somewhere around 90% correct, but it's a really good first pass at doing this research. And so we go in and we pull out this information and we use this specific query to, um, for our researchers to go and start to basically verify this information and set up how we're going to do these requests. Um, I'll walk you through one more uh, just sort of simple one. Um, let's see. Um, so this one here is very similar, but what we're asking the AI to do is we go as part of this, we pull down a Wikipedia extract, basically the first paragraph um, of a Wikipedia article. And we ask it to answer a few different questions based off the schema from that Wikipedia article here. And one of the things I just want to highlight is something we found interesting for both validating and interesting. I'm not sure if it actually improves the results or not, but that we ask this thing to provide its reasoning uh, along the way. And when you're going through and validating these things, and we do all of these things that we put in the app, we see there's human in the loop, we're validating the outputs. Um, but having this reasoning here is uh, you can sort of pick up really easily where an LLM is failing just by seeing how wrong its reasoning is for things. So, and that's an interesting thing to add to this. Um, so let me share the app uh, real quick. Again, Chrome. Is Okay, um, and I'll just go into a little more detail about what these different things look like and what some of the output is. Um, so these are the documents um, that we add in. When we pull them back, we count the tokens in the documents uh, and we try to parse out the date that the document was um, last updated, its effective date. Um, this is company overview. So we're asking a bunch of questions on that. Uh, we try to determine whether or not the company is the data broker, given uh, you know, downloads, basically a bunch of CSV downloads from the California and Vermont data broker registries. Uh, this is an output of <clears throat> what those data categories are. And you can see uh, this is all the data that the company collects or what they say they collect on privacy policy. And what does the score mean on the right? Like it, goes, it seems to go from one to 10 or something? That's actually, um, because we're initially using models with small context windows, those are the IDs of the source text, which is down here, oh. um, where that is pulled out. Uh, 
And so that was just the way that we were going through. And instead of it, instead of it repeating the source text for each one of these things and filling up that context window, we mapped it to a set of IDs and then had it generate just one version of each source text. Got it. And what you're, you're saying so much in every sentence here, but let me go back one more. Um, sure. Did I hear you say correctly that you you pull the basically in structured data, every company that's um, listed in the California registry of data brokers. And then <laughs> at some point in here, you're doing like a match to see whether the company that you're looking at uh, the, the um, privacy policy of is also listed in the data broker registry. And you're doing that through an LLM, like through a prompt. Yeah. And it's like, uh, whether or not to do that, that's easily something that can be done with like a fuzzy search also, you know, it's like it's super easy. And so, um, the idea is that we sort of, we have an LLM do it. And honestly, I think a fuzzy search is probably better at doing that. Um, uh, but I was curious to see how good an LLM would do it. At, so we added that in. in this what, what's the answer? Like, how was the performance when you spot checked it? There are some things where it gets wrong. Like, uh, you know, it will, it will say that a company is like Zoom, what we're on right now. There is a company called, I think, Zoom Info in the data brokers registry. And when Zoom.us is uh, put into it, it goes, oh, Zoom Info, this must be a data broker. So, uh, so yeah, I would say, you know, like all stuff, 90 to 90% great. Um, but, you know, you got to watch out for things like that. Very informative. Thank you. And sorry, I didn't mean to break your flow, but I just want to make sure we're we're uh, hitting some of the top of the waves as you uh, as you come kind of yeah. testing at yeah. us. Yeah. And so this is that first prompt that I showed you. This is the output of that. Wow. Um, uh, so you can see the different data rights. We say, you know, do they explicitly say who can who can use it, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'll try to see if there's some more interesting ones, third party sharing and selling. Um, you know, we're basically asking, do they say that they uh, sell data? Do they say that they share it? Do they say that they sell it um, uh, specifically as defined by the CCPA? Who do they share and sell it to and with? Um, who do they buy data from? Who do they collect data from? This is relevant to see, would they even have a user's data um, for us? Uh, this blurb, we just sort of fine tuned a model that generates these really little blurbs about a company given a, a Wikipedia extract. Um, and down at the bottom, these are the sort of final output sentences that we use in the app um, uh, at the end. So, and again, we started to, we, this summer went through a process of um, figuring out a way to validate this information. So we created a framework to validate all of these questions and sub questions in here uh, and created a, this is a pretty hacky interface, but this is what we would use to validate things. Um, so we have a set of validation instructions, instructions that were generated by this really brilliant fellow named Juan Hay that was with us this summer. Um, and we would go through and manually validate these things based on this rubric on the right and basically mark it as good, wrong, or could be better. And with that, we have uh, in our database, we have like the value, which is the answer. And then we have the edited value for each one of these. And so we would, if they're wrong, we fix them. And then with the fixed answers, hopefully somewhere down the road, we could possibly use those as a way to you know, fine tune a better model to do these things or things like that in the future. So the validation process is not just about validation, but also creating a, a really good gold data set. Um, so I'll leave it at that. And uh, please uh, let me know if anyone has questions. Outstanding. Um, uh, Dr. Lance Elliott, um, uh, you're on um, active alert that I may call upon you, just so you know. I see you're in the audience. Um, one quick thing I just have to say is uh, this is great work. Thank you for taking the time to present it um, so that everybody can see how you're coming at this. Um, there's It's really a time of true um, kind of innovation and creativity as people are seeing this these powerful tools and trying to think how could this apply to something I'm actually trying to do. And you've really like taken it all the way um, and it's, it's well documented, it's clear. Um, one base question I have um, is, is have you been able to uh, get your head around uh, like the, the for the average time it would take to process these policies manually? Um, 
at uh, number one is 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 it comparable time or I would imagine it would be significantly lower time for similar information and number two um what about the quality so how much you know when like I have been in the position of looking at terms and conditions and policies hundreds and thousands at a time for various projects and I know my quality it starts to dip a little bit after the 10th and 50th and thousandth one of those, but nonetheless, like I, 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 how how is the quality compared to people? So time and quality, um, LLM versus people for this task. What's your assessment? The time, this is way faster. Um, I think that we calculated it was like fifteen hundred percent faster or something like that. So um, the first eighty companies we put into the app took months of researching into privacy policies to do it, and in that process, we had a brilliant researcher who uh, created this. Uh, like basically a structure and protocol for doing this research. And that really helped this process. So it's like that protocol was used as ways that we, you know, talk to the LLM and get it to go and answer these things. Um, so I like, it's way faster, of course, you know, we could run this thing and run, uh, you know, hundreds of companies through this thing in a day. And then we have to go through and validate them. Right. So regardless, it's way faster um, to do it quality wise. You know, like I said, there's like it's uh, still in that 90 to 95 percent range, but things are wrong and you have to go and find them and fix them. But it's still way faster um, uh, doing it this way. And to your point, as a yeah, it's like uh, our own researcher, you know, and and even when we were going in and creating like our own, we we went through at the very end of this in the validation process and hand coded like 20 of these companies to use as like a gut check. And even in our hand coding process, we missed a ton of stuff, you know? Um, and, you know, so that was illuminating. And also hand coding these things is terrible. It's like the least fun thing in the world to do. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers it. it. It does. Thank you so much. And I see we've got one uh, more sub substantive we've got a few questions uh in in chat and through uh, dms here but uh, we can get to at least one more before we need to go to the next segment which is from um nolan uh, and the question is do you think generative ai based legal classification extraction um will make the current generation of legal due diligence document discovery um ai modes obsolete um yeah I don't know. That might be a question more for you. Like I, my sense of this project is this is a directed project and the goal of this project was, was to produce the content we needed to produce in order to, to add infinite more companies into this app. Um, so I, my general sense of working with LLMs is they're great at transforming information. So um, I'll leave it at that. And maybe if you have answers to that, that's I, I have a one perspective, which is um, you know, obsolete's a big word, um, and uh, so no, um, not. Uh, but I, I, I'm what I'm already seeing actually. What and I was just involved with a friend of mine who is general counsel of a company that was being acquired, and there's a lot of due diligence there. Um, is that the the current tool set still does some things that are non-overlapping, especially when you're going through financials and, you know, due diligence and document discovery is kind of a big umbrella. There's a lot of different things you're doing based on the facet of the task, some of which don't overlap with LLMs. Some some stuff, LLMs seem to be comparable or better at. And really interestingly, there's a whole class of things that these LLMs can do that we could never do before at all. So I imagine we're going to see a period of sort of co-evolution um, will it be a you know like like humans e existed with uh you know like uh, with uh, Neanderthals for a long time simultaneously? So I think we're gonna see like a kind of a a period of dual evolution, and and there's gonna be some uh some things that other technologies continue to do that at least as long as we have the transformer model and the sort of probabilistic um approach um with LLMs that 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 the that this technology just doesn't do so but overall though I I, I just tend to see a lot of promise here um it just keeps over delivering on things that I think are interesting and good and very very relevantly I just can't stress enough what Dan said several times which is it is not perfect it, it's it has like some flaws some limits some biases and so don't worry, y'all. There's a continuous role for um, humans that have judgment and can look over the outputs and be the final say. Um, oh, 
uh, it looks like Lance, it, so can I, I just want to do one quick dep deputization, then we'll move to the next segment. Um, we're actually joined by another colleague, Lance Elliott, who is a real um, expert on, on the advent of this technology in the legal field. And Lance, I just want to give you a chance to come off mute to see if you had any um, answer as well. Since you're in the audience, I want to like deputize you for a, a hot second to see if you have any perspectives on that question. Sure. Can you hear me? You sound good. Oh, great. Uh, so first of all, I apologize. I was on another Zoom call and it finally ended. Uh, secondly, it, it sounded like at the tail end there, there was a bit of a discussion, maybe, and, and stop me right away if I'm off target, about the idea that uh, large language models, machine learning, deep learning, is all focused on what in the AI field they call sub-symbolic approaches, which is you look at data, you find patterns in data, based on those patterns, you try to make predictions. And that's really what generative AI is all about. Now, you might also know there was an earlier era of the AI field about expert systems, knowledge-based systems, where you explicitly wrote out rules that you would then have the computer system try to execute or perform those rules. It almost sounded like there at the tail end, and I might be off target, that there was a bit of a discussion about where are we headed with generative AI LLMs What's that future look like? And if that is kind of the question, then my answer is uh, it's what uh, many refer to as neurosymbolic AI. The idea is that you combine both the subsymbolic pattern matching with the kind of rules based approach together in combination. And even Sam Altman, who is the CEO of OpenAI, he has come out and said, LLMs and machine learning, the way that we conceive of it today, can only go so far. Something else has to break through because today, so far, we've gotten away with just getting larger and larger models and greater and greater computational processing to get where we are now. And the belief is, yes, that will continue to take us forward, but if we really want to make it like all the way to an AGI artificial general intelligence kind of capacity that we have to come up with something else. And some believe that that something else is this neurosymbolic AI. So Daz, I'll, I'll just pause there. I don't know, I may be off target from what the group was talking about, but maybe that nonetheless is of interest to the group. That was of interest, uh, thank you. And that and, I, and that was non overlapping with what I had said as well. So I sort of said the, assume we have the same kind or more powerful of the same kind of LLMs, it won't be a complete obsoleting of the prior tech for uh, due diligence and discovery. I, but that's a really good point, which is one thing we can count on is change. We're not gonna have, I don't think this is the ceiling and there will not be any further evolution of of the of um, of the technology. And, and in addition to the symbolic, generative AI mashup. I think people like in Microsoft and other places are looking at planning AI and like just other modalities that they can start to mush together, all of which could could change the whole playing field again. So thank you, Lance, for letting me um, tap you. Uh, we've got one more comment from Brian and then Kara and Rich, you're on deck. So, you know, kind of warm up your engines and we'll, we'll go to you as soon as Brian has made his contribution. Yeah, and I'll keep this short, but to, to what Daz was saying, um, you know, obsolete is a huge, huge word and a huge concept. And I don't think traditional due diligence will become obsolete. You know, it's always been sort of in this pattern of continually evolving with the technology that is used to evaluate it with. So I think that trend will continue. And, you know, an example that I think um, demonstrates how this could happen is with some of these note taking apps. Um, that use generative AI. Um, so I know a lot of people here probably use them where uh, the app makes a recording and a transcript and lets you query the notes from what was said in the call. Um, so one of the things that I've seen just in very personally that I've started doing in these calls is I'll start signaling like, so the action items from this call are this. And so you start learning to use the tool in a way that allows you to leverage, you know, large language models, generative AI to the fullest extent that it can be leveraged. And I think that's sort of the area where due diligence will transform. I think people are going to find the, the sweet spots of using LLMs, generative AI, all of these cool new applications 
in ways that reduce the total amount of time that it takes, that increases the effectiveness of the due diligence process that drives the operational expenses of that process down, and that allows us to get through due diligence quicker with less of a, less of a headache, I think. So that was all I had. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and incidentally, um, I'm saying all these names. I should have mentioned, hi, I'm Daza Greenwood. I'm, uh, I, I head up law.mit.edu, of which this idea flow is one little um, thread. Um, and Brian, who just spoke, Brian Wilson, is editor-in-chief in, editor of the MIT Computational Law Report, which is kind of the flagship publication and um, um, public-facing facet of law.mit.edu. So, there you go, and thanks, Brian. Now, um, let's move forward to the next course in this meal. Um, we have with us co-founders of a new initiative called Describe.ai, um, who are doing some, I, I think, really impressive work um, applying generative AI to case law. Um, and so with that, um, uh, Kara and Dan, I'm just going to ask if you could introduce yourselves and, and tell us more about how you're applying generative AI to case law and you know, sort of what does describe do? And, and in particular, what, what can we do now that we could never do before? And then we'll go right to discussion. Excellent. Thank you, Daza. And thank you so much for having us here today. We're very excited to be um, joining you from Newton, which is uh, Newton, Massachusetts, which is right outside of Boston. So certainly close to MIT. Uh, my name is Cara Peterson, she, her, and I am the co-founder of Describe.ai, as you mentioned, and I am not the technologist. That would be Rich, my husband, and um, I am a marketing and biz dev person. So I think for this group, Rich will have the more interesting things to say. So I will hand it off to him. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Richard DeBona. I am uh, I come from a traditional computer science and software engineering background at in the corporate world. So I was able to bring some of that experience and architecture and everything else, computer architecture, over to this field. So I think the best way to talk about this is I could show you a quick um, demo because it's the type of product where once you see it. That's that's really the magic of it. So let me do this. Okay, you got you got it. Okay. So basically what we've done is you could search for any type of uh, legal concept or term or case facts, whatever you want in here. So I'll just do a quick one. You could see it. Search for, I was just making things up, landlord invasion. <laughs> um, so I'll just do like child was injured at a playground. So this is good. Like if you're a lawyer, you could search for specific legal terms that will, are relevant to what you want to look for. And if you're not a lawyer, you could search for something simple like this and find case cases that might be relevant to you so that you could learn more about the law. So you look through, um, it. you could narrow by state here, but the way it works is we've read in all of the original legal opinions in, and kind of split them up and summarized them and made them searchable. So for example, here's a case. This opinion describes a case involving a child who was injured while playing on playground. Good. Well, not good for the kid, but a uh, good for our search. Um, and you could see if I click through, we I'll work a little backwards here. Here's the original opinion. So you could always refer back to the original opinion. These opinions are super long, as you all know. Some of them, there's an opinion I, I ran into that initially crashed the system that was like 977 pages. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so there's all kinds of opinions out there. But if you, what I've done is broken the opinions up and then summarized them for, and it makes the search more precise. For example, in this, you could see in this case, Clyde Wright brought a negligence. Then the second part of the opinion describes a child named Jordan who was injured while hanging on a roller gate. This is another part. And you could see this fourth one down is actually the one that it found as a match. This opinion describes a case involving a child who was injured while playing on a playground. So it it 
by breaking the opinions up, I mean, it was done out of necessity because the language models at the beginning of the year when we started encoding could only handle small context windows. Um, but now that they're able to be bigger, I still think this was the best approach for what we're doing because the search engine searches in every single one of these. And then on the results, it shows you the one that matched the best. So that's one part of it. And we're working on other things too. For example, if I click on this one, we're doing something like what they mentioned at consumer reports. I mean, on a different type of scale, but we're actually deep reading into the opinions and having it tell us like, here's the parties, here's the introduction, background, procedural history, issues presented, analysis, holding and conclusion, so that you could go right into here. And if you're an attorney or someone else interested in the law, you could see exactly what this opinion was. And then down below, you still get the summaries and the original. But this is a good way to just quickly glance. And this was all AI generated using some, uh, as as Dan could attest to, it, it's a big iterative process using the figuring out these prompts to get this stuff out of there. But we're going through and we're um, making these types of uh, precise summaries for every single opinion. They're not generated on the fly. It's like as you when when you use a search engine, you'll see everything's instant because the cases don't change. So there's no reason to there's no reason you can't summarize them in advance. So we just summarize them, keep them in the database, match them up, and it everything's super fast. You don't have to wait like 20 seconds for it to come back and summarize. So there you go. That's that's the quick uh, demo of it. Amazing. Um, so um, a couple of things. Uh, first of sure. all, thank you for, for taking the time to walk us through. I agree. There's nothing better than a demo. Um, could you speak a little bit? So part of the reason I wanted to bring you forward to show this so we could people could know about it and we could discuss it was um, to demonstrate what's different about generative AI when it comes to mm -hmm. searching for uh, case law. Um, and one of the things that's that to me is kind of profoundly different and almost mind blowing in its potential is that we're not searching for words or phrases anymore, but we can, in a sense, in the kind of high dimensional vector space that this uh, data has been atomized into um, and through the models, um, uh, we can all, we can sort of see as it were of the concepts or the ideas behind the words um, and 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 that's what happens with the kind of cosine similarity and the the semantic searches that are that are going on. And if I understand correctly, that match score, like in this case for um, Rio Linda Unified School District versus Superior Court, we've got a zero dot eight nine two one, which is pretty high uh, when I when I do these things. Um, could you speak in a little more detail about what is that little score and what does it mean? Um, this isn't the same as like we have three matches. Um, like it's not like yes or no. Um, it's a score that relates to relevance of a of a new type. Like what is the score? What and what does it mean? Sure. So on the the people on the call may have heard of vector databases or seen it in a article or something that they've read. On the the way they work is is we don't have to get too much into it, but what Daza said, they store these numbers to represent concepts and language and everything. And so if I were to have store in that database, something like the dog was sleeping in his dog house. And then I typed in the dog was sleeping in his dog house. That would give a hundred percent match. If I said the cat was sleeping on the cat bed, that's like a similar, it's, it knows it's an animal. It knows it's sleeping. It knows that you know, it matches it up. So that would give like maybe a 90. In this particular case, we're going to have a hard time getting over like a 90. 89 is, is actually quite high because we're searching these entire paragraphs. And unless you get this exact paragraph almost exactly, you're not going to get like a 100% match. But 
it finds this relevance because um, it talks about it. There's a child, there's a playground, there's an injury, there's, um, you know, they were, that the more you put in or the less you put in, the more it can match up to here, it, uh, it, it will make that score a little higher. And now in this particular case, when I click through, each one of these, like this first one doesn't mention a playground at all, I don't think, just glancing at it. So this probably would be a lower score. This this looks like a slide onto concrete. That might be a middle score. Then this one, this is the actual one it found. So it the thing grades each one. And what I've done is just return the highest matching one without repeating. Be, you know, you don't want to repeat like you don't want to send back like five from the same case because so it just pulls out the highest one that matches based on that vector matching score. Does that answer your question? Amazing. And just just to drill down a little bit more on this, sure. So come up concepts like um, let's say you have the word child. We see the word child here. So in some ways, it's not a great example of what I was trying to get at. But like, it, it, let's just say like you're a you're just some person. You don't really know the cases, or maybe that the word child has like special resonance and and is noted in specific statutes and regs and case laws. And so you're saying maybe other words to talk about like young people or like my children sure. or my um yeah. or, or minors or or maybe talking about something. a different facet of it like so people that um have extra rights under the law who blah 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 it could start to sort of it, it sort of sees these yeah. clusters of cases and can find the underlying meaning and it's assessing relevance based on that um fyi everybody this is huge <laughs> like we could never see the shape of the law before um, we could only do um, very brittle, literal, like word and phrase searches and, you know, like regex kind of stuff. Um, this is pretty important because um, it, it might tell us for the first time, what is the law anyway? <laughs> like just what are, what are, what is the, what, what are the underlying rules and how could they apply to my unique circumstances? Even if I'm using different words or the facts and circumstances are playing out a little differently. Um, this really gets down to relevance and relevance is, is, um, you know, is a deep, deep rabbit hole and the kind of semantic um, inference engines that are available through this technology can help us begin to plumb the depths uh, of these, of these quintessential concepts for law. Daza, do you want to, on our, on our pre-call, you mentioned the thing about Wyoming. Do you want to mention that where you were using it yeah. and you found... That, and that's partly why why you're here today. So I was I, I was helping the state of Wyoming. That's a good anecdote. Uh, who was looking at some legislation to advance their um, policy agenda to give um, individuals and companies more rights over their digital information? Um, in a sense, that's this is kind of um, 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 you know compatible with um, with the Consumer Reports. Um, um, thematic, um, you know, initiative we just heard about giving people control over their digital information. Um, but one of the things that's different is Consumer Reports was based on California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, what they were trying to do in Wyoming was just look more generally at what is the relationship between people and our data. Um, and they were following a state law framework of property. They were saying, among other things, it's also property. It's a kind of personal property. But it's not um, physical; it's intangible or digital. But but you know when we create it or when we perfect rights to it, um, it's still a type of property, and we should be able to have at least basic property rights. And property rights are a state law, very much a, an area of state law. So this isn't a rather unusual. I, I think logically it applies perfectly. Um, and they were looking to clarify some of that. Um, intellectual property has kind of confused that a little bit. So now we have this other statutory framework of you know, that names things certain ways, but that's like a little off to the side from just basic property that we've had for millennia uh, as a concept in law. And so I wanted to see cases that stood for that principle. Um, and so I put in, I, I so I asked some very basic questions about, um, you know, what are like legal, I'd have to go back and find the prompts, but it was to the, where's the effect of like, what are legal principles that, that um, stand for the, um, the rule that people have, um, you know, property rights over 
um, over their digital information. And when I asked it that way, it pulled up a bunch of cases that I'd never seen before, because uh, I guess I hadn't been searching the words correctly, but there was this whole rich thread in tax law about intangible property. There was a bunch of stuff about um, kind of um, interest that people have to like their, um, to their um, kind of like customer lists and to, you know, kind of database information that used very different words. Uh, there was information about like what people that are creating digital art, but it wasn't copyright. Um, it was, it was, so anyway, it was really interesting that it got underneath. Um, and uh, Ash, Ashish, if you uh, raise your hand, if you want to um, say something about it, I think I saw your finger. Uh, but anyway, so I was really impressed that I was able to ask a question one way and it identified a lot of case law that stood for the idea I was trying to get at. Um, and, um, I've never been able to do that before. I kind of had to just, all the onus was on me to think of all the right words to use, or I had to hit like pay dirt on a law review article of somebody that spent years, you know, tracking down every case. But even then we miss cases. Like, how do we know that there's a case out there that would be relevant to what we're trying to do if we don't know what the words of that case are. And if somebody hasn't gone through and taxonified it in a way that relates to what we were searching for, all of this is very brittle. It's very superficial. And it is, it doesn't let us know what the law is. This technology at least has the prospect to allow us to unleash and to reveal um, what the law is and to connect it to, you know, the questions that we have about how it would apply to given facts and circumstances. So, so that's my sort of anecdote about how I started using describe and how I was like, kind of blown away, basically. Um, and, and it really was helpful to the legislature. I sent them the stuff that we turned out and it helped inform their ideas of how to then frame things in, in some, some uh, statutory reforms that they've been considering. So it's very useful. It's very mind blowing. It's very practical. Uh, that's my anecdote. Cool. Yeah. And, and along those lines, I know we we're wrapping up in a minute. Um, the way like people out there, if you're a pro se person or or just you're involved in the law for some reason you don't know all those words either so you could just type in what happened to you and then suddenly you'll like if you type talk about your mother somebody coerced her to change her will then suddenly you'll learn like okay I, that's called that's undue influence so why don't i you know this thing will tell you it's undue influence and so you could know what to research indeed um so if people wanted to play with this, so I, I would, so we are out of time. If we had a little more time, uh, I would actually suggest that everybody go to describe.ai um, and it's D-E-S-C-R-Y-B-E um, dot AI and try some searches and like try it for yourself. Um, see how this plays out. Um, and and uh, and then I would ask you to share your results so we could talk about them. So I can't do the last part, but I can do the first part, which is go and check it out. Um, and then uh, to the extent that you're on LinkedIn, go to the MIT Computational Law Report uh, post about today and make comments. And you know, let's continue the conversation in that way. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Kara. Um, everybody, we have some really interesting things coming up. Um, the wow. Uh, Rachel, if you could go on mute. Uh, we've got um, the 2024 MIT Computational Law course is coming back uh, at you. It's free and open to all um, in January. And uh, we're going to go much deeper into many of these topics and give you all an opportunity to use some tools and to get even more deeply engaged. Um, and and thank you all for joining us for the sort of resurgence of idea flow. I know we've taken a long hiatus, uh, but we're back, baby. Um, so thank you all, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye bye. Thank, thank you, Taza. Thank you. Thanks Daza. everyone. Bye. Thanks everyone.